presenting on uh, wellness and the practice of law. Our first speaker on this issue is Professor Ronald Tyler, a former federal public defender and currently a professor of law and director of the Criminal Defense Clinic at Stanford Law School. And the clinic not only represents indigent persons in superior courts in California, but also focuses on self-care skills for lawyers. And following Professor Tyler, Judge Lasnik will moderate a discussion on wellness in the legal profession with the Honorable Phyllis Hamilton from the Northern District of California and our very own um, Monique. Thank you very much and enjoy. Okay, I think that means that I'm on. Um, thank you all for having me. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, sorry that I won't be here to be present with Judge Hamilton. Uh, Judge, it's nice to, to see you on, on camera briefly. Um, I have so many fond memories of my time um, as an advocate in the Northern District of California. Um, I'm now, as you've heard, um, the director of a criminal defense clinic at Stanford. And in that capacity, um, I um, supervise our students who um, together with, with a, a colleague, we are with them in court, um, oftentimes in the superior courts of California, but now also beginning to be present um, in collaboration in the, in the courts in the Northern District and the federal courts as well. So um, I only have a few minutes available to spend with you, but it was really important to me to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, the, the importance of self-care. When I came to Stanford nine years ago, I realized that um, since I was going to be doing research and writing as part of a necessary scholarly agenda, that what I really wanted to focus on was um, how it had been that I'd been able to spend two decades as a federal public defender and, um, and arrive at Stanford intact, um, with an in intact relationships, uh, intact well-being, um, and what could I do in order to help make that more possible for others. And so over time, I have integrated self-care concepts into my clinic, um, and I've also um, begun uh, making presentations around the country uh, for, uh, for practicing attorneys about self-care, primarily folks who are doing work in indigent, in indigent defense, but, but uh, more broadly as well. So um, in the short time that I have with you, I want to just sort of give a few highlights about what I find to be important in, in self-care. Um, and so what I, what I want to do is to encourage us all to recognize the signs of burnout. Um, and then I wanna talk about um, both ways we can adopt short-term coping mechanisms to deal with things as they come up, and then also to encourage you to engage in some long-term serenity practices. Um, and then a little tip of the hat to the importance of encouraging organizational responses to burnout. So, so where I would start then is just to invite us to recognize the kinds of signs of burnout that we can see uh, so that we can address them. Um, and I wanna talk about these signs in over five different realms, the physical, the emotional, the mental, the behavioral and the social. Um, it might feel a little oppressive to hear me go through all of this, but hopefully it's, it's worthwhile. And so when I think about the signs of burnout in the physical realm, I think about, uh, top of mind for me, pervasive exhaustion. This constantly feeling tired even after, even after sleep. Um, I, I think that's a key sign really of burnout. I think physical tension is another, tension that we feel even at times when there seems to be no need for that physical tension or, or physical pain that we just push through um, and try not to, to, to focus on. Um, insomnia or excessive sleep, also signs of burnout in the physical realm. When I think about signs of burnout to be aware of in the emotional realm, the ways that burnout can impact our feelings, um, 
top of mind for me, um, what some people call the Sisyphus complex, the feeling like no matter how much we do, how much we give, it's never going to be enough, that victory is followed by endless battle. Um, another sign of burnout in the emotional realm, a hypersensitivity to emotional content, or a disconnection from emotions and feeling like, I, you know, I ought to be feeling something, but I'm not. Uh, or a sense of helplessness or hopelessness um, or uh, anger, resentment, uh, cynicism. These are all, can all be hallmarks of burnout um, in the emotional realm. Uh, in the um, in mental realm, burnout can impact our thoughts in a number of different ways. One way that it can impact our thoughts is we can end up having an inability to see multiple perspectives. Um, and, you know, as lawyers, it's so important that we're able to actually be available to look for multiple perspectives. And this is something that can become shut off for us, or we can end up jumping to conclusions without, without reflection. When I think about clinical education, one of the hallmarks of clinical education is encouraging our students to engage in reflection. And that's one of the first things that can depart uh, when we're feeling the impacts of, of burnout. In the behavioral realm, the hallmarks of burnout can be, um, well, top for me again, uh, absenteeism uh, or worse yet, attrition, just um, people absenting themselves from the profession entirely because they're simply no longer um, available, no longer able uh, to be present. Um, or people are still there, but you know they just have no longer a real interest in things that used to provide them with such a sense of positivity. It feels like kind of like a, a blues song or something. The things I used to love, I don't love anymore. Um, that kind of feeling uh, can be a real hallmark of, of burnout. Another obvious one is escapism, escapism into drugs or alcohol or food or, or more work. Um, very clear um, signs of, of burnout. In the social realm. I said there's a physical realm, emotional, mental, behavioral, social, the, the fifth of my parade of horribles. In the social realm, and this I think is especially evident during this pandemic, is the sense of isolation that so many of us have, have, have felt and, and still feel. Um, that can also be a hallmark of burnout or, or only interacting with coworkers or having no separation between the personal and the professional um, or devaluing those who are in other fields, um, difficulty in relating to others or a, a sense of persecution or, or martyrdom. These are all ways in which burnout can be present in the social realm. Um, so what I said I wanted to do, though, is not just invite you to reflect on whether or not you recognize any of these particular uh, hallmarks in your, own, in your own life or in the lives of people that you care about. But what I want to do is to spend my waning <laughs> minutes talking with you about things we can do about this, suggestions, things that from the research, things from my own work with my students, that things from psychology, things from other, you know, um, coincident um, uh, areas of, of research and work that can be, that can really be worthwhile. So I want to talk about adopting short-term coping mechanisms, things that you can use in the moment when you're recognizing the kinds of stresses and anxiety that over the long term can lead to burnout. And then I, I want to talk about engaging in some longer term serenity practices. So first of all, in terms of coping mechanisms, um, some of my favorite coping mechanisms that I, that I uh, encourage folks to consider are about grounding, what, psychology, what psychologists call grounding, uh, mechanisms that will allow us to focus our mind and our physical senses and, and to soothe ourselves when we're in, the, when we're in that uh, stressful moment. So mental grounding is about focusing your mind. And you can do that by, for example, imagining a pleasant image. Um, for me, I love nature. I love the coast, the northern coast of California. And so when I'm in one of those stressful moments, maybe what I can do is pause for a moment. Imagine that I'm actually in Mendocino County on a beautiful seaside bluff and get all my 
senses involved in that moment. So I can hear the sound of the sea lions below. I can smell the sea air. I can feel the wind on my face. So just taking that moment will help me to not get totally spun up in the anxiety of the moment. That's, that's mental grounding. Another grounding method, physical grounding, is a way to literally focus your physical senses. So perhaps to take a break, to walk to the restroom, to pour, to run water on your hands and to put the water on your face, to just feel the water run down your face. And in this way, remove yourself from the moment that, that was that moment of tension and anxiety and to just allow yourself to be present for physical senses, to similarly um, focus on your breath and just notice and allow yourself to calmly breathe in and out. Uh, some people will have an object that they will have like an, an amulet almost in their pocket and they can just reach into their pocket. Maybe it's a smooth stone and they'll just, just feel that stone for a moment as a way again to remove themselves from the, for a moment from the, the stressful moment. So these are, are different coping mechanisms that, that I recommend. The last one is what's known as soothing grounding. Some of you will remember this self-help book from decades ago, How to Be Your Own Best Friend. Think about if you were talking to a friend who was in this moment of stress and what are the kinds of things that you would say to that friend and say them to yourself, you know? Uh, this is a moment I'm going through. This is going to end, actually. I actually, I've got this. I can deal with this. It's not that big a deal. Whatever it will help that you would say to a friend, think about those and say those things to yourself. Um, another thing that that uh, psychologists recommend is that we think about planning a safe treat that, you know, when this moment is over, I'm going to do something else instead that's going to be good for me, a safe treat, not why I'm heading to the bar, you know, but instead I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take a walk with a loved one, or I'm going to, I'm going to cook myself a nice meal or something, plan a safe treat so that, you know, when this moment ends, that's something that's going to be available for me. Um, so those are some suggestions about things that we might do in the moment that are coping mechanisms. But I want to spend just a few minutes talking about and encouraging you to consider things you can do on a long-term basis, things that are about a, a serenity practice. And the first thing I would say to you um, it comes to, from positive psychology, and it's a, it's a theory called self-efficacy theory, which says if you're in, inviting someone to learn a new skill, remind them the ways in which they already have acquired some of that skill. And so the truth is we each and every one know the things that we can do that will make us feel whole, the things that return us to a sense of serenity. And so, you know, remind yourself of those things and, and do those things. So if it's, if it's going for walks, if it's, if it's, um, um, engaging in a period of, of uh, doing something like yoga, whatever the things are that you're already doing, just remind you or that you have done, remind yourself that those are things that you've done and pick them back up. Um, the other thing that I want to suggest is not just this reminder about things you've done, but I have a few things to encourage you to consider as you move forward. Um, and those are, and these are the things that I encourage with my students, and there are three. Um, therapy, meditation, and gratitude. Uh, students, even in 2021, are quite surprised to hear someone saying to them, therapy is a good idea. Therapy is something we can actually talk about. Therapy is something we can actually encourage each other to do. Um, it, um, I have found to be a, an extraordinarily important thing uh, to do and to lift up as available for everyone. Um, I'm mentioning meditation as the second one. Meditation is pretty in vogue these days. I think it does afford uh, really wonderful opportunities for us to just be able to take a break in a moment, uh, even if it's a uh, uh, four or five minutes. I think meditation, when done on an ongoing basis, can actually really deepen our sense of connections to ourselves and to others, can deepen our sense of empathy uh, to others. Uh, and then the, the, the last thing I want to mention before I bid you adieu is gratitude. Um, the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley, thinking of Dean Chemerinsky, the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley has developed a, um, 
a gratitude practice known as three good things. And I think it's a great practice. The idea is at the end of the day, you think of, you sit down, you bring, you, you have pen and paper, and you think back over your day, you think of three good things that happened in the day. You bring them out of your head into the real world by writing about them. You give each one a title. You write down everything, about, as much detail as you can remember about why this was a good thing. You write down how you're feeling now just remembering that good thing. And you write down, why is it you think this good thing happened? And if you do this on a regular basis, what, the, what, what research has actually shown is that people who, do, who have done this even literally for just a week uh, had, uh, were able to maintain a positive attitude going forward for, uh, for a full half a year, just based on doing this for a week. So imagine if it's something that you do regularly, then you create an ecosystem uh, and a, a feeling of positivity that can just carry you forward and create this added resilience as you move forward um, in, in your life. So, um, so those are my, um, my comments and suggestions for you. Um, thank you very much for just giving me uh, some time to talk with you about all this. And um, you know, I look forward to uh, uh, you having a more fulsome uh, conversation um, with the panel as you move forward. Thank you, Professor Tyler, for those comments. And I know I could have used those when my Wi-Fi went out in the midst of my interview with Professor Chemerinsky. So hello, Judge Lasnik. Welcome to the virtual stage. Hello to everyone out there. We are about to be joined by uh, Judge Phyllis Hamilton from the Northern District of California. There she is. And by Monique Neal, our Chief of U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services, for a discussion on wellness. The title is Wellness and the, and the Practice of Law, but we're going to be talking more about wellness and the court family, wellness and judges, wellness and probation and pretrial officers. So let me first thank uh, Judge Hamilton for making the time to, to join us. Um, she is a very busy person, uh, and part of her being busy is doing uh, the, being the chair of the Wellness Committee for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. But I want to just give a little background here. There was, uh, we heard about Justice Stephen Breyer, and he chaired uh, something called the Breyer Committee on Judicial Disability in the mid-1990s. There was a thinking that, you know, some of these judges are staying very long, and maybe they're not really that sharp, and they might be mentally disabled. And so this whole concept of looking at judicial disability and what do we do about it became part of a committee. And Proctor Hug, who was the chief judge of the Ninth Circuit in 1999, started a disability committee that morphed itself into a wellness committee. And isn't it nicer to talk about wellness than it is to talk about disability? And Judge Hamilton has been the chair of this committee for 11 years now, and uh, since 2010. And so it's obviously a labor of love to her, but it's a labor of love that she bestows on her fellow judges um, by being there, because this is an extremely important issue. Uh, and um, uh, Judge Hamilton, welcome, thank you. And tell us about how your view of wellness has evolved uh, in your 11 years chairing this committee. Well, first of all, thank you, Judge Lasnik, for uh, inviting me to uh, join your district meeting. I really miss having these meetings in our district and we're hoping to get back to them soon. Um, but um, I have been on the Wellness Committee for 13 years, the 11 years as its chair. And um, over the year, well, as Judge uh, Lasnik said, it was first a response to sort of negative reporting about the aging judiciary. That hasn't really changed. I mean, the average age of Article III judges, anyway, is 69. That includes both active and senior judges. Um, so that's still uh, one of our concerns, but it became pretty clear pretty early on uh, in the early 2000s. The committee was established in 1999, but as early as 2001, uh, the committee had determined that, well, we're not a disability task force. We're really more interested in wellness. 
And what I've discovered over the years is when you couple wellness with disability, you're less likely to be off-putting, right? People, uh, uh, issues of disability, particularly those involving cognitive decline, aren't issues that people wish to really embrace. I mean, we, and we have discovered that what we really need in order to be successful over the years is a level of enthusiasm and engagement. And um, so we have expanded um, our scope and we're now about to issue this summer a brand new wellness guide. Um, we did away with our old wellness guide, which just really dealt with disability and how to respond as a court. And now we're actually going to be talking about strategies um, um, for maintaining and achieving health and wellness. Um, so it's been a, an evolution of sorts for sure. Sure. Now, uh, judges are notoriously difficult uh, to sometimes get to talk about feelings, especially older male judges think such things are frivolous. How have you been able to penetrate some of that resistance early on to this, this entire topic? Yeah, it's, you know, it, it depends on how you define older versus younger judges. I mean, you know, finding myself now as an older judge. Um, um, I would say that the thing that we need to do is to not give up, you know? You need to keep talking. And it's interesting when you engage people in, in certain topics, um, uh, it is interesting how somehow the, sh the, the guard comes down, the shield comes down. One of the things that we've been most successful at is with our newsletter, our quarterly newsletter called Courting Good Health. And the reason that that has been so successful is because we recruit other judges and staff members to contribute uh, to it. I mean, all of our articles are written by someone who works within the Ninth Circuit and primarily judges. When judges are willing to open up and to talk about their own challenges, their own frailties, other judges are willing um, to respond. I'll give you two examples. We had, um, in recent years, we had an article written by um, a retired judge, Stelton Henderson from my district, who suffers a really debilitating um, muscular disease that has you know, rendered him essentially wheelchair bound in his older age. And he wrote for us about how practicing Qigong, uh, which is sort of like a Tai Chi kind of thing, it has meditative uh, aspects to it, how that helps him to deal with the emotional and physical um, impact of his debilitating uh, physical disease. Uh, we got lots of great responses to that. And then on the circuit, Judge uh, William Canby, who's in his late 80s, has been on the wellness committee for about 10 years with me. I just won't let him off the committee. He's a great contributor. But he wrote to us, uh, he wrote an article for the newsletter about relinquishing his power at age 80 to hear cases. I mean, one of the things that I think circuit judges miss when they assume senior status is the participation in en banc panels. And Judge Canby wrote a very, two actually, two articles, very heartfelt articles about why it was important for him to leave before people, he, he, the, I think the title of the article was, I'd rather them ask, why is he leaving now than why won't he leave? And he talked about just relinquishing that, um, that, that authority, but serving, being able to serve the court in alternative ways. Uh, he's still doing motions and he does committee work and other assignments. Why that's important to him. And believe me, he's sharp as a tack. He's, uh, he's you know, been a huge contributor for years. So those kinds of articles open things up. And then we have smaller meetings and gatherings. We meet with senior judges, et cetera. Um, and I think when one judge is willing to open up, others follow. So that's one of the big successes that we've had. And Judge Hamilton, just for the record, you would be the baby judge in the Western District of Washington, <laughs> the youngest judge, because uh, Judge Martinez at 69 is now our youngest judge, not the county senior active, district judge. We have younger magistrate judges. 
right. but among the district judges, you would be the baby. So, uh, well, I'm uh, 68, so I'm right behind him. <laughs> yes, I know. And both Judge Hamilton and I uh, were appointed by President Clinton uh, in the latter years of his second term. Uh, and uh, it's, it's so great to have her here. Let me turn to our uh, probation chief, Monique Neal. Uh, you know, she got selected over Zoom. She's been running the office over Zoom. And she's done meetings like this over Zoom. And I really wish you could all get to meet Monique because she's a wonderful person with a great life story. And, and, and uh, let's hope the next time we do one of these, Monique, that you're able to be there uh, and, and meet some of the lawyers uh, who should get to know you. But your uh, probation and pretrial officers have a different situation. They are dealing with extremely stressful life situations involving offenders who under the best of circumstances can be challenging. And now you throw on top of that, um, either people who are coming out of jail or prison or uh, facing uh, the possibility of jail or prison. How have your officers been able to keep their uh, wellness and what have you done to help them achieve that? Thanks, Your Honor. First, let me just say um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And yes, hopefully one day I will get to be in person and meet many of you. Um, you know, wellness, especially during this pandemic, has been at the forefront of our office because wellness is important. It was important prior to the pandemic and uh, the importance of wellness has increased since the pandemic. Um, and we have a number of things that we've been doing um, over the years um, to help with this. And we have a district wellness committee. Um, we have a probation and pretrial services national committee. Um, we participate in various trainings. Um, part of keeping officers safe in the community and keeping their well being um, in a positive state has a lot to do with training. Um, and how to interact with clients in stressful situations and just trying to remain calm um, and be able to go home at the end of the night to their families. Um, and we practice a lot of breathing techniques. I know Professor Tyler talked about that, just grounding. Um, that's become a really important tool for us. We use a lot of breathing techniques. Um, we are really um, focused now on verbal diffusion um, verbal de-escalation in stressful situations. Um, we try to, um, especially during the pandemic, we've tried to keep our connection, even though it's virtually, by holding, you know, after hour Zooms, uh, where we're just, you know, having a time to be social and talk to each other and see how everybody's doing. I've made it a point to check in to each of the um, the staff meetings in the various units to check on people. I make sure staff knows that my door is always open um, if they wanna come and talk to me. I've really tried to pay attention to some of the signs that Professor Tyler talked about as well. Um, you know, seeing burnout or noticing that people aren't performing as well as they, they previously have um, or um, excessive absence. Um, I've noticed in the virtual meeting, sometimes I can tell by a person's appearance that they just might not be looking like they're doing well. And I've made a point to call them and check in. And in some situations, I've learned that they're not doing well. Um, during this whole time in the pandemic, I did have an officer who really um, had a hard time. And luckily he was courageous enough to reach out to me and some of his colleagues to let us know that he wasn't doing okay. Um, and we all really gathered together and provided him support um, and made sure he had resources outside of work um, to help him recover. Um, and I made it a point to check in with him weekly when he was taking time off, just to let him know that I cared um, and that we were thinking about him. And so we just really try to keep that connection. Um, I think it's important to just let people know that you care um, the work is always going to be here. Um, we're going to get the work done, but we're not going to be able to get the work done if we don't take care of ourselves. And so we've just really tried to make that a priority in our office. And I'm, I'm really thankful for our district 
wellness committee who, who sends out um, mess positive messages on uh, what we call Wellness Wednesday. And they host different events, um, different events to acknowledge the staff. A couple of weeks ago, we acknowledged all of our admin assistants um, on, on their special day and staff dressed up in superhero costumes to demonstrate how much the admins are appreciated and how much we think they are superheroes and let them know how they are, how important they are to us in helping us get our work done. So we've just tried to be creative during this pandemic and keeping that connection and letting people know that we care and um, keeping, keeping the lines of communication open and trying to make people feel safe to express if they're not doing well. Well, if I know Chief Judge Martinez, he's already planning for us to wear super uh, costumes, uh, superhero costumes at the next judges meeting. So thanks for that, Monique. <laughs> uh, Monique, uh, when, when I joined the court in 1998, probation especially, because they were separate probation and pretrial services, but probation especially was heavy on the macho testosterone and those, the kinds of things you're talking about would not have ever happened in that climate. How much of the change, and you've watched it in your career, has been having a woman in charge, first Connie Smith and yourself, and more and more women in leadership roles in, in the national probation and pretrial services? You know, um, I do remember when our office used to be like that. Uh, when we were separate, I started in the probation office. Um, and, you know, historically, that's kind of been the, the image of probation officers. And I think just we've learned over the years that um, there's more to just enforcing conditions um, and trying to make people follow the rules that, you know, it's really more about relationships and um, how we can help people um, to be more successful in their lives. Um, I don't know if it's just women specifically that have helped change that. Um, I think, um, you know, as we talk about diversity and inclusion, just sometimes adding different perspectives to the conversation helps, be that people from different backgrounds, different races, um, people in different positions like myself, when you have more people um, contributing to the conversation and trying to find solutions to a problem, um, I think you just progress. Um, and, you know, Connie, the previous chief, Connie Smith, she was really, really good at that. Um, and I think she really did help us change the culture um, just based on what was important to her. Um, and she made it a point to bring in many different voices um, to the, the discussion. And I think we've just kind of naturally transitioned. Um, and we can see now with all that's going on in the world, how important it is, um, you know, to focus more on de-escalation and, and verbal diffusion and uh, building relationships, you know, in working with the clients in our community, um, opposed to taking um, a stronger approach. Great. Uh, Judge Hamilton, how about from your perspective? You, uh, when you joined your court, there had been one uh, woman chief judge, but now we've had two in a row with Claudia Wilkin and you, and it's it's not any novelty anymore. It's sort of the uh, the way it, things it's are. Expected. <laughs> it's expected, and it's it's wonderful. But have you noticed a difference in wellness issues dealing with women judges? and men judges or older judges and younger judges, what have you seen and how have you adapted to different uh, age groups and, and races and genders? Right, I haven't really seen much difference in, in terms of genders. There are gonna be people of both genders that are gonna be engaged and embrace these issues. Um, and there are issues with regard to the different generations, for instance, the older, uh, well, first of all, I should say the younger generations are more likely to already be interested in a lot of the issues that the Wellness Committee is going to look at. Um, and they all already have, um, you know, um, engaged in different practices. They're more likely to be exercisers, you know, and people who are more in tune with their bodies and their 
their diets and what have you. So there is some distinction there between the older generation and the younger generation. But I have to say that um, we did a, um, um, a memory and aging um, study. Uh, we concluded it in 2019 in conjunction with UCSF Memory and Aging Clinic. And I enrolled um, uh, 36 volunteers throughout, throughout the Ninth Circuit um, of judges who volunteered to undergo neurological examinations and uh, cognitive assessments as part of a study to determine if judges, because of their uh, uh, mentally challenging work, are super agers. Um, and I had some, a, a handful, a half dozen of judges who were under the age of 60. 60 was the cutoff. So we had um, judges primarily over 60, but I had a handful of judges who really, really, really wanted to participate. They were all in their early to mid fifties. And I got permission from the director of the study to allow them to participate. And they were just as interested in cognitive decline as the older judges were. Most of us who participated in it were interested in establishing some sort of a baseline. If we were gonna go through a four hour examination, we wanted a baseline that we could use in the future uh, for, uh, for our own healthcare planning. Well, the younger judges felt uh, just as enthusiastic about it and were even more uh, excited about the prospect of making mental status, you know, part of your regular um, health uh, routine, you know, when you have your an annual physical. So, that sort of surprised me. The older judges all joined into the study for various different reasons. Some had, you know, family history concerns, things like that. Me, I just wanted to know what, what am I looking towards? What am I looking forward to? But um, the younger judges were really quite excited about it. And I, I um, uh, really appreciate that. I, I can't remember. Did I participate in that? No. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Judge Hamilton, you just finished uh, six years as uh, chief judge, and the last uh, year plus of that uh, chiefdom uh, was during COVID times. Uh, you had so much on your plate uh, to deal with, uh, including four days after George Floyd's death, the shooting and killing of a federal protective services officer at the Oakland, in front of the Oakland courthouse, and uh, basically a drive-by assassination. Um, what were the challenges for you and how did you keep your own um, self-centered and, and, and uh, mindful under these terribly challenging circumstances? Yeah, yeah, it was a pretty miserable 2020 for sure. Um, shutting down, which I thought was the hardest thing I'd ever done in March, March 16th of last year, was nothing in compared to reopening and trying to work and keep the um, wheels of justice turning during the, co uh, the pandemic when indeed on many occasions the courthouse was literally closed, but, but we were still um, uh, uh, trying to work on our cases and to make sure justice was served. Um, so it, you know, it, it wasn't just a matter of worrying about the judges. I mean, your chief judge will attest, I'm sure, that it's a huge operation our courts are. You know, becoming chief, I really sort of got into the bowels of the court for the first time as a judge and realized there's just so many different component parts. And during the pandemic, a lot of attention needed to be paid to lots of different cohorts than just the judges. Uh, we have a huge um, clerk's office. We have, you know, our court units, our probation and pretrial office, offices. Uh, it really helps if you have a strong clerk of court and strong um, probation and pretrial services chiefs. Um, but I felt a great sense of responsibility for everyone who works for the court. And that would include our de federal defenders, the U.S. attorneys who appear regularly in our courthouse, um, our law clerks who really, really needed um, some time and attention. So I made it I thought that the best thing for me to do was to make sure that there was plenty of contact, communication, and collaboration. So getting uh, judges uh, involved in um, task forces to deal with 
various issues having to deal with, you know, public access, access at the jail, you know, getting the defenders involved as well in uh, uh, task forces, having to deal with attorney-client communications remotely, occurring remotely, how to, you know, carve out time uh, in the holding cells or at the jail, working with U.S. Marshals. Um, it became this huge, huge, huge project. But by getting lots of different people involved and getting a lot of input and by making sure there was plenty of communication and contact, I had regular, regular meetings. I wanted my judges to be apprised of uh, as, you know, almost everything uh, that I was doing. And I made it a point also of talking with the magistrate judges who had their own separate interests because of the nature of their statutory responsibilities. I met with the law clerks who had their own uh, interests and what's, what's really, and I met with the CJA lawyers and the defenders. And what's interesting is that a bright light was shown on lots of different, um, different areas by virtue of these communications that I had. Uh, and one of the other things that I did was midway, what I thought was gonna be midway through. I mean, in six months, right, we knew that this thing wasn't going away, right? It wasn't gonna just disappear. So uh, late last summer, I conducted a survey of the student externs, the law clerks, clerk's office staff, probation, pretrial, judges, everybody. I did um, surveys uh, just to find out what they were most concerned about. And what was interesting to me was that on both the staff side and the judge side, the biggest concern was personal fa and family health and public health. Though that was one and two uh, for everyone. But then, you know, things, uh, uh, things changed a little bit. And mm -hmm. my judges, I have to say, so many of them were just so devastated, uh, you know, saddened by the fact that we weren't able to serve the public in the way in which the public had grown accustomed to us serving them. And that is, you know, in person, efficiently, um, and, and, and the, the disappearance of jury trials. Um, it, it really struck a chord with, um, with our judges. And the other thing that I found, um, uh, rem not remarkable, but one of my observations was that the loss of autonomy, you know, judges are their own little, fiefdom, right? We, uh, we run our shop, our chambers, right? But um, with that gone, with all staff for the most part, 92% of our employees were, you know, by May working, teleworking. And um, the loss of autonomy has been um, difficult for the judges. Uh, sure. Narrow you, told, you, you told me what you've done as a leader and how you able to, to to keep the court running and doing the things, meeting with people, taking surveys. But how did Phyllis Hamilton keep herself together at the end of one of those long days when your mind is going through, I, oh, I did this and this, but I never got around to this or that. How did you keep yourself centered and mindful? Um, living my life intentionally, making decisions every day, that would result in me getting some sense of peace or mindfulness at some point during the day, whether or not it was just, you know, being quiet for a moment. For me, physical activity is the, um, the way in which I uh, relieve steam. So I just sure. tried to be as active as I could yeah. be. For me, uh, I averaged 19,200 steps a day in 2020. Um, I went for long walks uh, uh, around my neighborhood and always tried to hit two parks a day. Uh, that was what I did for myself. Uh, yeah. Monique, how did you keep yourself together? Um, that's what I did as well. My husband and I would take evening long walks together just to clear our minds and, and get some fresh air. And um, I think, uh, like Professor Tyler said, I just always try to remember what I'm grateful for. Um, and there's so much that I'm grateful for that that really just keeps me going. 
Um, and, you know, trying to have that separation from work and personal life. Um, I love to spend time with my family and friends and I try to leave work at work when I can and uh, just enjoy myself um, with the personal interests that I have. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Chief Neal, you, the uh, probation and pretrial services, especially probation, I think, has had uh, a couple of suicides nationally that were kind of shocking to people. and. Uh, uh, the suicide, so the suicide rates were already up there. Um, how have you addressed, you, you mentioned a situation where you check on people and you see what's going on. Um, you've also had very few COVID cases in our district and the few that you have had didn't get it on the job or anything, but that's not the case across the country, is it? No, it's not. Uh, matter of fact, I think it's South Dakota the chief there said that two thirds of his staff caught COVID. Um, We've had only two cases in our office and both um, had contact outside of work um, where they were exposed and luckily both of them recovered quickly. Um, So I've been very thankful for that. And um, I give the credit to Judge Martinez and all of the judges for just really acting quickly uh, when the pandemic hit and just shutting down and gathering all the stakeholders and creating working groups to figure out how we could continue to get the work done um, in a virtual environment. Um, And to speak to the suicides, yes, suicides is actually um, a pretty um, hot topic right now in our system. And as a matter of fact, earlier today, I participated in the first workforce trauma workshop um, where actually Judge Martinez and I Um, did a mock telephone call that was used in the training where I called him to advise him that we had an officer um, involved in a shooting, a possible suicide. Um, Hopefully I never have to experience that in real life, but um, we've had, I think, five or six suicides in the last three or four years. As a matter of fact, we had a suicide Um, New Year's Day of this year where an officer killed his wife and then himself. Um, So it's become a very important topic and obviously um, as evidenced by the training that was um, put on today, um, probation and pretrial services and the AO are really trying to talk about it more. Um, You know, historically officers have been afraid to speak up when they've been suffering for fear of losing their job or, you know, for fear of what that might make them look like in this type of career. And we've really been trying to work hard to make officers feel comfortable speaking up when they're suffering so that they can get the help that they need. Thanks, Monique. Um, Judge Hamilton, you mentioned to me that one of the people who helped keep things sane in your district was our new district court clerk. Uh, Ravi, who I think is on the line here, uh, mm-hmm. Ravi's Romanian, and uh, uh, you were so kind to not uh, tell us, oh, he's a loser, don't go there at all. Uh, you helped uh, get him selected by the judges here with what you and some of your other colleagues said about him. But uh, let me give you a minute to just sing Ravi's praises too to the federal bar that will, that will uh, meet him later. Yeah, Ravi, Ravi was certainly a superstar at our court and our the go-to guy for all things um, COVID. I don't know how we would have gotten through the first year without Ravi's guidance um, from facilities to, you know, ev- everything, you know, the floor plan, you know, jury protocols, everything, uh, Ravi, and the person to interact with the experts that we hired. Um, Ravi was uh, absolutely a godsend for us. And he topped it off. I think his parting gift to us, and we really appreciate it, Ravi, was working magic to get the entire Northern District Judiciary uh, vaccinated, uh, regardless of age, when the Federal Vaccination Center opened up in, uh, at the Oakland Coliseum. Uh, we've never asked Ravi how he was able to arrange that. And um, um, we will forever be grateful. Most of, a very, a large number of our staff are already vaccinated, which is wonderful. There he is. 
There's Robbie. Yeah, he's very, very talented. His architecture background really has helped us tremendously. Yeah. Well, uh, Bill McCool sent us aspirin. So uh, th th that was really nice, Bill. Thanks a whole bunch. But uh, Robbie, uh, as long as you're here, why don't you unmute and tell us uh, from the staff perspective, you know, what is it uh, like to have Judge Hamilton as chief judge doing all these things to try to make life uh, uh, as easy as possible under the worst circumstances that any of us have ever dealt with. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, as, as, you, uh, as you can imagine, I mean, this was a very complex sort of situation for anybody. And, and she, she has been, you know, incredibly, um, you know, we were incredibly lucky to have her. And we were on the phone or meeting constantly. And she's been, you know, uh, an incre incredible leader in terms of how to get people together. She talked about task forces. She talked about various committees, and that is what sort of got us to through this in, in terms of you know understanding people individually and their resilience, and how individually people have strengths that they bring to the discussion. And and, and I mean, Judge Hamilton, if you remember the executive committee met every week with a new subject or a new topic. And this, com this committee consisted of judges and the clerk and myself. And we, there were meetings, we had three and four hour meetings uh, discussing various topics. I mean, though that, luckily that wasn't the norm, but we did have many of them. And I think that is where, from a staff's perspective, it is that kind of leadership that is necessary and seeing that not only the judges are working together, there are plenty of staff who, who also participated in various task forces, who had expertise in various uh, areas. And we, we never said that we completely closed the court because we were always operating. We were proud of that, that we were able to provide service. And so plenty of staff I and mean, almost everybody I came across were willing to step in and you know, do something. And there were plenty of creative ideas. Uh, we had plenty of uh, people who were involved in taking on something on their own and saying, how about tackling this? How about this idea? And so it is, it's a collective sort of thing. And if we, we have to work together and that, that's what Judge Hamilton showed me and you know, and in in terms of what a chief judge can do, and and this is so fitting for me in the sense that she's here in this sort of day of transition for me, um, and and so thank you, and sure. and I, she's my she's my MVP, chief judge. Well, uh, and you know everything that you said about uh, Judge Hamilton, I would echo for Chief Judge Martinez. He was a rock for us. Uh, and uh, very, very difficult circumstances. And uh, I don't know if you've actually met Monique, uh, uh, who uh, will be uh, another uh, unit head with you. And so important that the clerk and the uh, chief of probation work together. And it uh, will be great to watch you two working together, first with Chief Judge Martinez, and then with whoever replaces me or whoever gets nominated and confirmed fast enough, uh, one year after that person joins the court, they will take over as okay. Chief Judge Hamilton. Yes. Can I just say, um, the, you guys were about two weeks ahead of us in terms of the pandemic. And I have to give a lot of props to the Western District of Washington. We followed your leadership and guidance on so many issues uh, because you were two weeks ahead. We knew what was coming. And we thought, well, what's Western Washington doing? You yeah. were the one district that we always looked at your orders and the things that you were doing and the way in which you were resolving things. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, the Western District of Washington for helping us get through the uh, pandemic to the extent that we have now. 